Hey, welcome to the Upland Nation podcast. I'm Scott Linden. So glad you could join me. A lot to talk about today. Pull out your shotgun. Make sure it's unloaded. Keep the muzzle pointed in a safe direction because we're going to talk about its care and feeding. Everything you want to learn about cleaning and gun care. We've got an expert in that world, Fred Bohm from Sage and Breaker Mercantile. But that's not all. If you're a photographer, amateur, or otherwise, Fred takes some of the best shots you'll find on the internet. We'll get some tips on that. And then what he loves most about our favorite subject, bird dogs and bird hunting. It's all coming up right here on the Upland Nation podcast. This week, I'll take you to school, economic school, on why... We should support local communities when we're accessing public ground. Yeah, a little bit of a lecture, but not too much. I think I'm just going to point out a lot of things that you've probably already figured out. But if you haven't, hopefully I prompt a few thoughts for you for this upcoming season. Coming up real soon. Fred's already on the line and waiting, but let me just um, ask a favor, please. Do myself and your fellow hunters a favor and this podcast. Please rate and review it at Apple Podcasts. That's how we get higher in the list. That's how we build an audience so that I can keep doing this. The sponsors are happy and so is everybody else. What are you doing these days about your own shooting? Right now, I am all over practicing my gun mount, trying to build that groove, you know, and now I'm expanding a little bit. I've told you a little bit about how I'm relearning the instinctive style. Now I'm to the point where I am relearning it on different guns. When I first learned it all, it was um, straight stocked, side by side, two triggers, nothing else. Well, I don't own one of those anymore. So um, I'm working with all the other stuff I do own in hopes that I can adapt all of those techniques to the guns I do have at hand. And I'll tell you, it's just like playing golf or playing tennis or any other skill that has some athletic ability associated with it. Repetition, repetition. Did I say repetition? It's all about hand-eye coordination. You can't do it without practicing. So I'm, I'm trying to do my 25 mounts a day. That means I have Scott, shotguns spotted all over the office and the shop and even near the front door at home. No, I'm, I'm not a survivalist. I'm not a prepper, none of that. But I am practicing, and that's one way to do it. A friend of mine's a guitar, very good guitar player. I'm a very bad guitar player. So the first thing he asked me when I said, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm trying to practice more. He says, do you have to take it out of the case every time? And I said, nope, it's right there in the living room. And he says, good, that's the key. Keep it handy. And it's working too, but don't worry. I'll never play my guitar on the Upland Nation podcast. Uh, speaking of the podcast, uh, just a moment, please, for Fred. But in the meanwhile, Sage and Breaker Gun Care Products, Fred's company, they're all crafted at the highest caliber. I'll call them heirloom products. You'll pass them down, no doubt about it. And if you don't get enough from Fred today, go to sageandbreaker.com slash blogs slash product videos. I can guarantee you, you will learn something there. While you're there, get on the mailing list, and then you'll have first notice before everybody else about the new stuff coming down the pipe. Speaking of coming down, I am headed for Huron, South Dakota this fall. How about you? If you're headed for South Dakota all, at all, you probably ought to look at Huron. Smack dab in the middle of pheasant country. More pheasants than people. Learn more about them at Hunt Huron SD. Go on the site, ask for your free information packet. It's full of stuff, including maps and other things that will help you access the 142,000 acres of public access ground in and around Huron, South Dakota. Well, you've heard the name of his company, 
over and over right here. Thank you, Fred Bohm, for being a sponsor of the Upland Nation podcast. It's about dang time we got to talk about something other than your commercials. So well, <laughs> welcome to the podcast, Fred. <laughs> Well, thanks for having me, Scott. It's about time we did this, and I, and I appreciate you having me on. It's, uh, you know, uh, we've actually met a couple times, but like ships in the night, uh, racing from one booth to another at a uh, trade show or a consumer show or a pheasant fest or something like that. Um, why don't you start with just, you know, the the, the basics. Sage and Breaker is a company that I, I describe as gun care products crafted at the highest caliber. What's the origin story there? Well, you know, like many things that do happen in life, uh, um, it wasn't necessarily intentional. I was uh, in an industry that I wasn't particularly fond of. I didn't feel like I was, you know, going anywhere. I was making just enough money to, to, to live life and take care of a family type of thing. Uh, but I wanted more. I wanted to be involved in an industry that I really loved and I felt passionate about. Um, so I came up with an idea. This was back in the – well, the idea came in, in 2014, but the company actually started at the beginning of 2015. And it was just the idea of making the the highest quality gun cleaning products. Guns – you know, now I'm into archery as well. I'm into several things, but there's something about our firearms where I, – I don't know. They get passed down through the generation and generation. I have firearms from my grandfather, and there's memories attached to these that every time I hold that gun or use that gun, um, you know, it brings back that memory. The same thing with my father. You know, he passed down his guns to me. And I got little ones now, and they're going to go to them, and there's going to be stories attached from generation to generation. So the thought process was, is A, you know, wanted to make a company that would help preserve these legacies, um, and B, to have some of this the, the, this – gun cleaning equipment that was is going to last as long as as these firearms that you're handing down your gun mat to your kids that it's going to you know be there throughout time and that's going to have memories attached to it so that was kind of the idea in the beginning um it didn't <laughs> now this is me looking back you know years ago of how i see it but you know at, at that time it was scrambling to come up with a design which our first thing was was it was like a boar snake but our own version uh, that we, you know, I thought was a, a better design and that would um, uh, clean a heck of a lot better. So started with that product and then we just kept adding on and adding on and uh, we, we got to where we're at right now. Well, I remember that first boar snake because you sent me a couple way back in the day and I was impressed back then and uh, I still am impressed. You've added on and added on and added on. I mean, what powers the thinking for new products? Uh, because you always have something in the pipeline. What are you thinking about before you say, yeah, let's pull the trigger, so to speak, on a gun mat or whatever? Sure, sure. No, I mean, everything comes down to you think about what you need personally. Like, okay, in, in my gun cleaning kit, what am I using every day? And then I look at those products and I look at them and say, well, how can I improve upon that? What's what's good about these that I could keep? And, and what's honestly not so, you know, something that I would like to change? And then I go out and do the research as well. Talk to people or look at reviews, that type of thing, and see where other people are finding those products that they – previously bought where they're falling short for them so i'll go in and do that research and then it just goes you know iteration after iteration getting it into prototyping um that could consist of you know in the beginning of drawings and i mean heck even with the gun mat um it's, this is a very family oriented business i flew my mother out from uh san diego where she lives now she she made quilts for since i was a little guy and so I brought her out here. I had this idea for this design. I wanted something that would protect your gun when you put it down on it and the surface that you were, you were uh, cleaning your gun on, as well as give you the ability to store all your gun cleaning products in it. So I came up with this idea, drew it out, and she literally you know, flew out here, and we're, we're cutting wax canvas and, and leather and sewing a prototype together, just trying to come up with uh, what was going to work. And that went through iteration after iteration. I and, love it. Um, Oh, yeah, you know that is it, that is right out of a sitcom, though. <laughs> Didn't plan it that way, but yes, I think you might be right. <laughs> oh, that's great! So lots of thought, lots of testing, lots of um, research, if you will, and uh, 
And congratulations. It's gone so well. You know, uh, I'm pretty proud of you. I feel like I was almost there on the ground floor. And, um, you know, people have glommed onto it. I mean, uh, last time I saw you in person, I think you had sold out of your um, your the, the rolled gun mat. Um, yep. And I think the same thing might have happened again over Father's Day, for that matter. I, I mean, how do you keep up with demand? It's tough. Um, you know, we, we've struggled with being a smaller company with that. Um, you know, it's not like we have big backers or, you know, anything of those sorts. It's just it's really a family run business. So that has been one of our, you know, growing struggles is to try to, you know, look into the, okay, next year, we're, we're growing at this rate, how much product are we going to need for next year? And inevitably, I blow it every single time. So <laughs> it's something I, I need to improve upon, but it, it, it has been rather rough. Um, but we're getting better and better at it. And uh I don't know. Hopefully, hopefully we don't do that as much. But yes, it is. It is nice to see that that the demand's out there and that people are really looking for, um, you know, some high quality products. We're not for everybody. I get that. You know, there are other brands out there that may may work for other consumers. But you know, we really are targeting the guys that you know they, they love their firearms. They love you know it's part of a, a lifestyle. Um, you know, and honestly, we target a lot of the upland guys because. Sure that's what we are as a family. You know, I, I go out with the wife and the kids, um, you know, we have real little ones, but we still take them out there and get them to experience this with us. Um, not that we don't cater also to any, you know, handguns and all types of other stuff, but this is really our wheelhouse. And, and, and what I love to do So you'll see our marketing, you know, incorporates a ton of, uh, a ton of upland to be honest. Oh, oh, I'll say it does. And in fact, that leads to the next bunch of questions, which start with, Pointer versus flusher, Fred. <laughs> well, these days it's going more towards pointer. But um, my original dog, now now that Sage and Breaker was named after uh, uh, my two hunting dogs, mm -hmm. Sage passed away a couple years ago, and he was he was a Labrador, and he was supposed to be supposed to be one of these fancy uh, designer uh, pointing labs, but. He didn't end up that way. The genetics weren't there for it. And that's, that's always a debatable one with labs anyway. <laughs> Don't get us um, started. <laughs> I know, I know. So we'll, we'll stay out of that, you know, we'll stay out of that gutter for sure. But um, he, he was a phenomenal flusher and I, I didn't want anything else besides that. Like, you know, we had a great time together. We spent, I mean, numerous days in the woods just chasing grouse and, uh, and anything else. And uh, so he was, he was my first real, uh, hunting dog and and he was phenomenal but then we got breaker along the way that was you know that's the wife's dog and he's still with us today and uh he's running around outside right now i think chasing the neighborhood squirrels <laughs> but he's you know and he's a pointer and then we recently just picked up another pup as well uh pistol which is an english setter so needless to say i'm all over the place because breaker's a po uh, poodle pointer so we're we're kind of everywhere but yeah well we see those it, it we matter. do yeah, yeah you're right and i'm the same way but uh i'm partial to the wiry faces um, but we see these dogs in in a lot of your uh, communiques um, advertising social posts etc cetera, etc cetera. we're going to get into that in a few minutes as well um, but before we go any further uh, I need to I have one more question to vet you and that is side by side over and under or a semi-automatic I'm I'm a over under guy. I got a a Satori featherweight twenty gauge that I mean there is just nothing to, you know in, in the grouse woods for me. I could carry that sucker all day. Um, and saying that above uh, side by side just because I never owned a side by side. And I've been into plenty of shop and maybe that's a you know a future Christmas present from the wife. We'll have to see. There you go. How good I am this year, but uh, yeah, I'm I, I'm a break barrel type of guy. Yeah, and you've talked grouse already a few times, but uh, you uh, that's not all you're doing. I mean, you're in Colorado. Are you ever going up into the hills for ptarmigan, for example? Or I know we are both planning on a trip to the southwest for this fall. What other passions do you have in the upland world? Oh, I mean, if there's a bird that I'm legally allowed to chase, I'll chase it. Yeah. So, yeah, and I keep saying grouse because that is kind of you know our local bird here, and I really love being in the mountains and the scenery, and uh, you know I like the challenge of it. But no, we we go after pheasant. Um, you know, we spend some time down in the uh, uh, down in New Mexico. Oops, excuse me, <laughs> last season. Um, 
Chase and Quail. We did that for a couple weeks, and we're planning on that again this year. We're going to be down in Arizona, New Mexico, chasing Quail, up to Idaho, chasing all the birds that are, uh, you know, they have a quite a variety up there. Um, sharp tails, definitely ptarmigan. When that season's in, you know, get up nice and high above tree line. Uh, I love getting after them as well. So honestly, any bird that's uh, that, that that they, you know, the Dow gives us permission to chase, I'll chase it. Well, let's talk about that that last one, the funny name bird, ptarmigan, um, uh-huh. because most of us will never do that. Give you know, give me the the four one one briefly. On a, a classic ptarmigan hunt, how wh- where are you going? How are you doing it? What's the strategy? Some of the tactics. Sure, and it's it, it really does come down to elevation. I'm sure most people know that they're very uh, you know they, they love the high country. So anything just getting on the cusp where you're just getting above tree line, getting into those thick willows, and then that you know the rocky slopes at that point. Um, that's where you're going to find them. And they the beauty is if you get up there early in the morning just as you know just before sun breaking you could hear them now i'm not even going to try to attempt to make the call that they make <laughs> but it is extremely odd and once you hear it once you'll know it uh you know it, it's not one of those that blends in like ah is it this bird or that bird no 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 it's it's very distinct and honestly you get up there early in the morning and you could listen for them um you know they'll, they'll do the typical thing they'll be up a little bit higher they could fly down a little bit lower to feed you know and, and vice versa so you could just kind of listen to them in the morning and then you work the dogs up above tree line right on the edges of, um, of willows is, is it, I, I call them will. I think that's what they're called in the high yeah, country. Yeah. What all of us call them. Yeah. Um, but yeah, just right along that area. And, and, and I mean, honestly, they, they're some of the best camouflage birds. Sure. So a, uh, a dog is, you know, is crucial, I would say. Um, but not overly the brightest birds either. Um, maybe they're just they they don't have the challenges of since they're up so high. Maybe they rarely see coyotes or whatnot. But once you get into them, you could you know they'll, they'll hold pretty tight. There's no doubt about it, which makes great for pointing dogs. Oh, and, uh, I love that idea. Yeah, yeah, they're they're a fun bird, and then and just the scenery you get when you're hunting them. It's just you know you're above tree line, these huge, tall you know mountains. You're Oh, I don't know. Maybe twelve and a half is the lowest you're going to be. Twelve and a half thousand feet, and then you know upwards of you know out here we have a bunch of fourteeners, but yeah. you'll see them on top of the fourteeners as well. So they wow. could be anywhere in between there. You so, know. so kind of a cross between mountain climbing and bird hunting. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, bring your harness, bring yeah, your climbing yeah, shoes, yeah. and yeah. Uh, yeah, get ready for some fun. Um, well, thanks. Uh, that's as close as I'll ever get to that sport. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Let's let's get back to your your bread and butter for a moment because you know your site your website sageandbreaker.com dot com has a whole bunch of stuff on it, um, including a bunch of videos. And for a lot of people, especially newcomers, learning how to take care of their gear is kind of a low priority. Um, your videos, though, can help us in so many ways. What are the, some of the more popular videos you have up there? Well, surprisingly enough, I don't know how it took off. Uh, maybe because we I posted it uh, several years ago, but our, our most popular, hands down, was the the Kimber nineteen eleven handgun. I'll be darned. Um, yeah, no kidding. That's that's. I said the same thing. I, I don't know why that one took off so much. Apparently, well, 19, 1911s are notorious. Uh, you know, they're they're tough to break down, so you certainly want instruction with those so maybe that's you know the popularity mm-hmm. where some of the others you know you look at a lot of the break barrels if you're not taking out you know you're not really taking it apart you're just doing kind of a field cleaning well it's not that complex and i think most people get the idea with that but some of the more complex guns um you know that's the more the more popular ones um so that one yeah i mean geez we got one hundred fifty thousand views on that one wow. and uh yeah, yeah. So so that was kind of the idea behind it is, you know, give people a really, you know, high production value so they could really see a bunch of different angles, know exactly what we're talking about when we're going through. You know, we're not just walking around with an iPhone. It's, you know, we had several angles of the camera set up and then just kind of walk you through the process of how to break it down, how to clean it, and then to reassemble it. So we're, you know, once a week we're adding a new video up and we're going through you know, popular shotguns right now, various handguns. We'll be doing some rifles as well. Um, 
but that was just kind of the idea behind it is just, you know, just help people out with this intimidating task in the beginning. You know, once you learn it, you're fine. You're good to go. You'll, you'll be able to break that, you know, gun down with your eyes closed. But in the beginning, it can be confusing for sure. Well, thank you. And um, thank you for holding on. You're listening to the Upland Nation podcast. I'm Scott Linden, your host. That's Fred Bohm. He's our guest, the founder of Sage and Breaker Mercantile. Uh, all your gun care needs right there. We're going to talk about some products and we're also going to talk about how to use them. And then Fred, so many people have asked me to talk to you about photography. So uh, get ready for all of that right after this. which is my chance to thank a couple other sponsors for supporting this program. HappyJackInc.com, Manning and Joe, reminded me this morning that it's flea season. That explains all the itching. Uh, they have a non-toxic, non-chemical process. It's a product called Flea Beacon. Look it up. Just go to happyjackinc.com and you'll learn all about flea beacon. If you've got a dog and that dog has fleas, no, don't sing it or tune your ukulele, but take a look at a way to eliminate fleas in the home, in the kennel, wherever your dog is sleeping, flea beacon. Go to happyjackinc.com. And then welcome to my good friends, Doug and Elisa at Roughland Performance Kennels. They're built like a performance cooler. You know, the one starts with a Y, but it has all sorts of other useful features. The one I like most, you can add a second door on the side or the back. So no matter what kind of rig you're driving, you could get at your dog from two ends and he can get out from two ends unless you're careful. Multiple colors, a ton of accessories. I love the water storage capabilities that I can put right on top of my Roughland Performance Kennel. Learn more at RoughlandKennels.com. And that's rough, rough. You know how to spell that, don't you? R-U-F-F, RoughlandKennels.com. And if nothing else, that last line probably woke you up again. Fred Bohm with Sage and Breaker Mercantile. Welcome back to the Upland Nation podcast. Well, thank you, Scott. Oh, good. For a minute there, I thought you did doze off. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, you, you said something to me a while back, and I hadn't given it a lot of thought. And, and as most people know, I'm just a music major, so I don't, I don't understand all of this you know, technical stuff. Or as one of my directors said, I'm just a caveman. Uh, grease versus oil. Lay it on me, Fred. Yeah, yep. So for the most part, our, like the CLP, that we make it is more than adequate for the lubrication side of things uh you know for, for your standard user now when, when you get to the grease we're talking a lot of the guys that are you know shooting a lot of rounds through ars to say or handguns you know they're putting 500 rounds through you may want that it's it's just going to give it a little bit more protection it's going to give it a little the, the you know the lubricity in there it's gonna it's gonna lubricate it so that the metal's not grinding on metal. Now, again, the CLP usually covers the majority of that. And then the other thing I really do like the grease for as well is just putting it on the threading of your, your choke, the choke yeah. tubes Yeah, kind of keeps it. And now if you forget about them for a while and it really heats up and you're, you know, you're trap shooting, skeet shooting, something of the sorts, they can get gummed in there. So, you know, uh, lubricating those with a little bit of firearm grease, not a bad idea as well. All right, so let's take that to the next iteration, whether oh, maybe a, a late season ptarmigan hunt. You're up there where it's pretty cold. Do we need to distinguish or be careful about what we use to lubricate and, and anything we use on our guns when the weather drop, when the temperature drops? Yeah, I mean, the, there are certain lubricants out there. You, you do want to look at that and, and, and what their temperature range that they're effective in. Um, you know, where hours it goes down, I, I, I got to look at the numbers, but I think it was around negative 80. So you're just, you're not going to hit that. 
Um, well, I mean, unless you're <laughs> hunting probably where birds aren't. So. Yeah, real, the yeah. real Himalayan snowcock hunts. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, not just the Nevada hunt, but yeah, yeah they're, they're real deals. So no, for, 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 like for our CLP, you're good to go, but you do want to look out there. You know, if you're using some other, other stuff, just be aware that, that that could become an issue. Um, you mentioned the CLP and I, I, I stumble over it all the time, cleaning lubrication and protection. Um, and there's another version or two out there from other people, but yours has a property to it that I've, I've been intrigued with. I live in the dust capital of the universe. And one of the things it does for me has nothing to do with dust. It has everything to do with magnetism. Am I thinking about that in the right way? Is it, is there a physics lesson in all of that? <laughs> there may be, but no, it, it is kind of it's an anti-static formula. Originally, when when we were looking into this, and you know what we wanted out of our CLP, and what is you know, and again, this goes back to what I was talking earlier. What were some of the issues that other people were having with uh, with with their products that they were using? And one of those was a lot actually of you know our our, our men and women overseas, you know, protecting our country. One of the issues they were finding being in these desert climates was, you know, sand, uh, dust, and certain things actually being attracted to the oils and sticking to them. So ours is kind of it's an anti-static where it it won't it won't attract it. it let's say that. Now, if you, you you dump sand on it, of course, it's you know it's going to stick like it would anything else. But you know, it, it, it is not attracting those contaminants, and that was one of the big things. The other big thing we really wanted to get into was, um, you know, making something that was non-hazardous and bio-based. Mm. Being that I got little ones running around, and, you know, I grew up with some of the more, um, you know, some of the old school solvents that were out there. And, and I questioned what, what damage I had done to my lungs <laughs> over the years. So that was a big one for us, is to have something, you know, that was around the house that was not going to uh, – you know, it was it was it wasn't going to be damaging to the lungs, and it wouldn't be toxic. Now, I wouldn't suggest you know do a shot of it on a Friday night, but it's it's not something that's going to kill you either. Okay, so uh, kids, don't try that at home. No, yes. no knocking back a shot or two of CLP, but everybody else use it for what it was intended for. And just Fred, take me to school on a post hunt gun cleanup i'm on the i got it's laying on the tailgate hopefully with a few dead birds the dog is is uh in his kennel dozing already after a fine day of field what do i do and when do i do it and how do i do it so for just a simple field breakdown real easy yeah. and you don't have to go crazy and i think that's where sometimes people they they dread cleaning their gun they're like oh boy this is going to be a half hour process it literally takes me, I mean, way less than five minutes. So I, you know, it have my shotgun, break it open. I'll spray down both ends of the bore, just spray some of the CLP in there. And, you know, it depends how, if I just cleaned it the day before on a hunt, well, you could pull that bore cleaning kit right through it. And, you know, just pull that through both barrels. And you just kind of want to hit, you know, anywhere in the breech there. And, um, you know, if it's looking extra dirty, maybe just take one of the nylon brushes, give it a little bit of scrubbing. If there's some areas that looks like it's got some seeds or who knows what, whatever you picked up out in the field, you know, you could use some of the gun cleaning swabs, but this is all real quick. Just boom, boom, get in there, make sure that the majority of it's out of the way um, and then wipe it down. You know, any of the metal parts, I spray it with the CLP and then just wipe it down with the cleaning cloth. So, and so, you're done. So I got my over and under and it's, and it's open and yes. obviously it's unloaded. Um, I'm going to spray that CLP up and down the barrel, wipe it off, of course. Am I going to spray it right there into into the, um, you gun guys know what it's called, you know, where the, where the opening is. Um, into the breech itself and, and then down the bores? Uh, no, yeah. but into into the, the workings where it swivels. You know, come on, help me there. You you know what that's called. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and then at that point as well, you could, you know, you, you could pull the fore end off and then you could break down the gun into those three parts and do it that way as well. Yeah, yeah. Spraying a little bit in there, yes, that is a good idea. That's okay. you know, where it's going to lubricate it from opening and closing. And I'll do that, you know, if – if I'm out on a week's long hunt, I'll just do that every day after the yeah, hunt. But then yeah. when I get home, then I'll get a little bit more intense. Then I'll make sure I break the gun down. Uh, you don't necessarily have to. I pull the extractors out maybe two, three times a year 
just give them a good cleaning. Um, you know, they're not, that's not overly difficult to do, but to do that every time. No, no, you could just do a, you know, simple field cleaning and just be done with it and just know that that is properly lubricated and protected. And, uh, you know, you're not going to get that, that pitting, or if there's a little bit of moisture in your gun case, um, type of thing you're not going to get that rust so that's it's always a good idea just to leave a light coating at the end there of the clp yeah you know, you know and, and that's the thing i like about the whole boar snake concept is it's basically a single pull and you're done yeah and yep. uh, and so like you said don't complicate matters exactly make it easy then people will do it yeah. <laughs> you know and it's all that much better for their gun then tell me what you love most about bird hunting Honestly, that I mean, it's so cliche, but I mean, it's the dog work, you know, I know everybody says it, but I think there's a reason everybody says it. It's, uh, there's, there's that bond between you and your pup and just watching them work and the sheer joy and how their eyes light up. There's not many of us. I, I don't think that could say that, you know, we, we, we serve our, our sole purpose, and you know like like a bird dog gets to do that's what they live for that's what they're bred for you know i look at my dog every day and i mean it's the middle of the summer and he's begging me to go hunting and i'm like how am i gonna solve this problem for him but just that that sheer joy of watching um our bird dogs work i mean so that's that's right at the forefront and the other parts of camaraderie it's you know going out with your buddies where some of the big game hunting i do as well you're quiet. You're sneaking around. I mean, you may have, you may say five words in if you're with your hunting partner in a week. You know, it's it's just everything is so stealthy and quiet. Where this, you're just out there and you're having a good time and you're talking and it's it's something I can very easily involve my kids in. You know, with they they're able to go out with us. Um, I don't know. It's that 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 just that social aspect of it as well. Man, the hair is standing up on my arms. I'm thinking about this coming season, as are you. Uh, we've talked about that before, and I don't want you to tip us to uh, you know latitude and longitude, but you and I are both uh, big fans of hot, dry, dirty deserts. And oh, yeah. you're making another trip. You were out there last year in the Southwest, and I'm going to be returning myself if you you know if you wanted to advise anybody out there listening on some of the more important things you need to take into consideration before you go on a you know a desert quail hunt unless you're going really far south and it's a desert chachalaca hunt or something like yeah. that <laughs> uh, what are the things that come to mind right off fred well i mean <laughs> You know, it's it's doing a little bit of research and finding these areas. Uh, e-scouting could go a long way, you know, especially you, you're you're going to want to find out where the public land is. Unless you're, you know, you're one of the lucky few that's going to be hunting private, um, you know, hop on something. There's there's tons of different applications out there. Uh, Onyx, I, I know there's a bunch of different ones, wh- whichever one you prefer using. But get on there, and a lot of these have these overlays, which will show you the BLM or the Forest Service, depending on what you're going after. And just get the lay of the land. And what I like to do is I go in there and I just drop pins and and just say, you know, scout here, scout here, scout here. And that gives me, when I get on the road and I have a general area, I'll pick a town. Okay, I'm going to stay. This is where we're going to stay. And we'll work, geez, anywhere between two and three hours outside. I mean, hopefully not that far, but yeah. outside of that town, you know, to, to work, check these different areas out. And then it's just, it's a lot of time behind the wheel getting out there and then just doing your scouting and uh and marking these areas there's just you no know, there's nothing better than just getting that you know burning out some boot leather um letting the dogs run and that's i mean that's about it and you're gonna you're gonna look for cover and, and you could read a lot about it like what types of um uh, vegetation you should be looking for for certain species of say quail um or or um you know, you could find out a lot about what you should be looking for, and you could even see that stuff then with Google Earth or on mm-hmm. those maps. Yeah. You could take a look yeah. on there and, and say, oh, well, this looks like good habitat for the, these animals. Where you could look at some others like, eh, you know, maybe not so much. Maybe you're going after, you know, quail that like, they'd like to be in the valleys, in the deep cut valleys, or some that like to be in the, you know, like scalies that like to be in the wide open, and, and you, you can't figure how they, they want to be there because there's no cover for them, but that's what they like. And, you know, depending on what you're targeting, it's easy to find the information on that particular, say, type of quail. Yeah. 
yeah. then go out there and look for that. And I think yeah. that's huge, you know, to get that scouting in even before you hit the road. I have I have a buddy much like you. He's also um well he's late to bird hunting and he's been a lifelong big game hunter. And he brings the same, uh, I don't know what to call it, same philosophy. He does so much homework, uh, preparation and research, and then scouting. And and to a large degree, I don't see that in the upland bird hunting world as much. But, you know, that that old adage that you kill birds with... uh, with your legs, not with your shotgun is, is so true. You've got to get out and you've got to look at this stuff. So I'm glad to hear that somebody with, with your experience and background feels the same way about it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's, there's, there's no easy route (laughs) with almost everything (laughs) in life. You just, you gotta do the work. Um, you know, and we do sit at home. That's the thing is we're, we're okay. What are we in here? You know, June and we're looking almost July and we're, 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 we're looking forward to the season. So maybe you're not able to get out, um, I don't know, and drive 12 hours down south somewhere to take, but you can e-scout, yeah. you know, you can, you can start prepping now for that hunt. And it goes a long way when you get down there and you could at least narrow down these hundreds of thousands of uh, acres of public land. Well, that's a lot to walk. So if you could give yourself a few spots to really you know, hone in on, uh, it's a good idea to start doing that now. That's Fred Bohm. He's the founder of Sage and Breaker Mercantile. Learn more about them at sageandbreaker.com. I'm Scott Linden, the host of the Upland Nation podcast. We're going to cover two more things with Fred, and I'm going to start with the probably the one that you guys, this is the eye-rolling forehead slapping moment for anybody at Sage and Breaker. People are calling you, emailing you. They're showing you on Instagram their biggest gun care mistake anybody take the prize in that world hmm biggest gun care mistake out there (laughs) it's going to be the most obvious one you can think of not cleaning your gun and you'd be surprised how often that happens when you You know okay so what happens so let's just say i'm one of those guys and i just don't so, okay. so put the fear of God into us, Fred. Uh, what's going to happen, <laughs> you know, in the middle of the season? Well, right away, nothing. You know, the first week or two, nothing. But what eventually starts happening, there's a lot of things going on when you're pulling that trigger and it goes boom. You know, there's that – when that gunpowder ignites, the, the carbon that it's spewing out into there, it is, it's, it's, it's a contaminant. There's no doubt about it. Over time, specifically to your bore – it could cause pitting in there. It could cause rusting. It's going to make, you know, little weak areas in there. And the same thing is going to go on in any moving parts. You could end up fouling those up. You could end up having, you know, the, the, the curse of all guns is just an unreliable gun. And I've seen it happen with friends and Hey, they're my friends. And I'm like, let me give you some CLP. I'll whatever it can't. I go duck hunting with some buddies in the middle of a hunt. And it's, 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 almost laughable but yeah the, the, the pump action will sh- seize up or their semi-auto there's a lot of moving parts in some of those things and when they get fouled up uh it's not going to be reliable you know there's very very uh, tight you know where where all these different parts are it's extremely tight fitting and and you know it's, there's a lot to it and if you start gunking that stuff up well there goes your reliability right out the window so there's that and then there's just over time you know there's going to be rusting you could get yourself to a point where you're going to be taking it to a gunsmith or it just might not be repairable you're going to be replacing parts or just buying yourself a new gun okay everybody there's a reason your drill instructor made you take that thing apart over and over again and then put it back together without any spares laying around on the table when you're done so be careful about that to watch the videos at sageandbreaker.com now my favorite part of our interview fred is going to be asking you for all of your secrets on how you get those great photos you know <laughs> and i gotta tell everybody if you're not on his social uh, media or on that uh, sageandbreaker.com website you're not appreciating near as much as i am but i see this stuff almost every day fred it's incredible it's beautiful it tells a story uh what are your secrets well i appreciate that scott um i don't know that there are any secrets the, the number okay maybe there is number one secret is get out there and, yeah. and get out there and if you're into the photography and you want to be able to take some better pictures 
Number one thing I committed to myself is get out there as often as possible. Number two is make sure that camera's with you. And believe me, that sounds simple, but that's a mistake I made from the beginning. Um, and then maybe the third biggest one is never say to yourself, ah, I'll get that picture later. Mm -hmm. You know, you, if the lighting's right, the clouds are right, all the above. There's so many things that all of a sudden, like when you're walking, you're like, oh, that's what, that'd be a cool picture. Well, there's something out there on that, that, that composition that you're looking at that's telling you take a picture. So if your brain says that, take the extra, you know, one or two minutes it takes to pull that camera out of your backpack or your, you know, your hunting vest and take that picture because that moment will be gone. You know, the lighting just precisely or how your dog's working or whatever it may be, that will be gone. So just take the time um, to take the pictures. You know, the technical stuff, you could find that all over the place. You know, how to use a camera, you know, how to get a shallow depth of field to adjust, uh, your shutter rate, your shutter speed in order to get uh, motion blur or not get that. There's all types of things. And that's, you know, you could find that anywhere online. Yeah. But that's craft. It, yeah. Right. That's further down, but take the picture. Number one, first and foremost, take that picture and, and, and just make sure you have a camera, whether it be a point and shoot or heck your, your iPhones these days or whatever, Androids, any of the above, the picture taking abilities with those is spectacular. You know, I, I, I debate some of the cameras I have, the bigger cameras that well, I still call them SLR, but I guess they're mirrorless cameras. Yeah. But I debate one of those are going to go out, you know, uh, it's going to get taken over by the, the phones and uh, the, the cameras that are a part of them. So just do, that's that's the big one. Take yeah. the pictures. For, well, <laughs> I, might, I might add, and, and maybe you're too modest, but, you know, the other thing that you do well, and, and most of us don't, maybe because it hurts when we're trying to get back up again. Um, you seldom take pictures from eye level and that's, you know, I learned that years ago from some of my videographers, uh, poor Lynn Berlin constantly has, he wears, he wears overalls and half the reason he wears them is because he's on the ground so much taking pictures of dogs with a video camera. But a lot of times you're doing the same thing. You're getting that camera at another level besides the one that's most handy, aren't you? Yeah, and I think that's important, and that's getting into a little bit, not technical, but yeah, I'd love to talk about this stuff as well. The reason is you walk every day at, you know, standing, just your normal eye level type of thing, and you see that every day. It's not necessarily overly interesting to have somebody take that exact same picture. That might be a beautiful backdrop. It may work for landscapes, that type of thing. But when you have a subject, that that that's a whole different ball game. You're what you're doing as a photographer is trying to force the viewer's eye where you want it to be. And a lot of times you could get what ends up happening with pictures is you, you, you blend into the clutter of the background. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times, like what you're talking about when somebody gets down a little bit lower, what you're trying to do is get either the subject, whether if it's a human, you, you know, you want to maybe head or shoulders above that horizon line. It makes them pop. It, 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 it declutters that picture where they're not just blending into the background and that's also a use a reason a lot of people use a shallow depth of field now people don't know what that is if you ever see a picture where you know this person in, or a dog and it's in perfect focus but the background looks blurry that's shallow depth of field and again what you're doing is you're saying okay this background's a little bit important it's adding a little bit to the story but that's not what your your eyes first supposed to go to it's supposed yeah. to go to what's in focus and that's another way to force the viewer's eye where you want it to be. And it's a big difference between photography and video. Video has to, has to work with to tell the story, over to help tell the story. You got music to set the mood. You got motion to help take you from one place to the next. Still image, is, is, it's, it's a much, uh, it's not better, it's not worse, but it's just, I, I, in my eyes, I think it's a bit more difficult to tell a story um, in one single frame. So it, it gets more interesting as well. Like, how can I tell the story? What foreground elements can I add into this picture? Um, you know, maybe the, the hunter is the most important part, but then the dog's in the foreground and it's a little bit blurry. Okay, well, now you know he's hunting with his dog. And in the background is the plains or, you know, like a wheat field. Okay, maybe he's hunting for pheasant or there's a little pheasant tail sticking out of your. Uh, game bad. These are all little elements that you could add into your images that just make them more interesting for the viewer. Whew. You want to see how that all applies in, in the real world, go to uh, 
the Sage and Breaker Facebook page. Um, that's probably the easiest way for us to get a, you know, a lesson on how to take great photographs. That's Fred Bohm. He's a founder of Sage and Breaker. Learn more about the company and their products at sageandbreaker.com. We got one more thing to talk about in the world of public access, but before we do, thank you, Fred, for being a part of the Upland Nation podcast. I appreciate you having me on, Scott. We're brought to you in part by Dr. Tim's Natural Performance Dog Food. Um, just about ready to put another video together on something that you can all relate to, and that is, you know, that stuff in the yard that ends up um, coming out of your dog. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about. Well, a lot of it is composed of what the industry calls ash. I know, I know, I said ash. But it is the 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 waste in the protein in your dog food that can't be metabolized. Now, it's a part of almost all of the stuff that your dog's going to swallow. Primarily, though, it comes from kind of the weird protein sources that you really don't want your dog to swallow. Feathers, ligaments, tendons, bones. He eats all that, processes what he can out of it, and the rest of it ends up in your yard. That's why the good dog foods, like Dr. Tim's Natural Performance Dog Food, have 8% or less ash content. Now, does your dog food tell you how much ash they have? You might have to go to their website and dig deep to find out. But if you're buying ash, most of it's ended up in the ground anyway. So check it out. Learn more at drtims.com. Use the code UPLANDATION and your first order gets a 30% discount. drtims.com. Love talking about public ground, whether it's privately owned or publicly owned. This land is our land in one way, shape, or form. And I'm a big believer in, you know, the things that matter, the people. Fred talked about camaraderie, and you know, I've talked in recent weeks about what we can learn by just trying to fit in in a community we're going through or staying in while we're hunting. I promise not to lecture you anymore, but I do want to just give you my opinion on this one more time. And that opinion is that hunting in many places is their sole economic development strategy. And you know the communities I mean, you know, there's a lot of them in South Dakota, but they're all over the country. The beer companies will give the tavern owners those big banners that say, welcome hunters. There's a reason they're glad to have you because you are powering their ability to make a living, support their schools, feed their kids, keep their business open. So consider buying fuel, groceries, and ammo right there where you're hunting. Find a chance to put a buck in the jar to fund the school field trip? Do it. You might learn some local intelligence, but that's a bonus. Don't expect a um, tit for tat. But you might also learn something about the local economy. And of course, you're starting on the right foot when you support that local economy. Thank you. I promise not to lecture you anymore. I'll have a place to go next week on the Upland Nation podcast. This Land is Your Land is brought to you by FindBirdHuntingSpots.com. New material every week to help you find places to hunt and to train and care for your dog. This week, I'm going to put up an interview I did with Bob Ferris. Bob's a legend in the uh, NAVDA world, wrote a book recently. This guy's got insights into training and testing for the North American Versatile Hunting Dog Association that are relevant to anybody with any dog. Take a look at Find birdhuntingspots.com and on that note I'll thank you for listening thank you Fred Bohm of Sage and Breaker for joining me learned a lot about a lot of things and I hope everybody else did as well just a reminder 
The way we grow around here is for you to tell one friend about the Upland Nation podcast. Would appreciate that immensely. Between now and next time we get together on an audio basis, we can talk at the Facebook pages, both Wing Shooting USA and Upland Nation. I'll leave you with this. A dad dog joke inspired by that recent holiday. What do a dog and a cell phone have in common? Both have caller ID. I'm Scott Linden. Thanks for listening to the Upland Nation podcast. See you in the field.